All right. So the PBJ sessions are meant to in, give kind of introductions to Python or to get hopefully get new people unstuck as they go through the Python world. One of the things I think I got caught up on when I was you know, young in Python was how do I write a script? How do I parse command line arguments? And how do I make nice output from those scripts? Because those are really handy. Python's really quick. It'd be able to write quick little utilities. And it'd be nice to be able to dress them up, uh, make them work really nicely, make them be able to parse arguments coming from command line easily. And so I decided to put together a quick little talk about using arg parse, which is included in the standard library as of 3.2 and 2.7. Prior to that, it was <clears throat> a built-in called opparse. So this basically is really similar to opparse if you've used it in the past. But argparse now has deprecated optparse, and argparse is the new way forward. So since 3.2 and 2.7, so it's been around for a few years now since then. And the big win here is the argparse is a huge time saver. So I'm going to show you some examples of how to use argparse, why you'd want to use it. Uh, there's, I'll put these slides up in the IndiePy GitHub area. Oh, did you get this recording? OK, good. Uh, this, the recording will be up online as well after the talks this uh, probably next week. So the links will be in here. The slides will be up on GitHub. And then the code that I showed during the talk will also be up on the IndiePy GitHub as well. So one of the things argparse is going to do for you is give you that usage statement. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, let me give you guys a quick little demo. Ooh, that's small. <laughs> so you can like my cow say uh, there. So, all right. So aren't they? They're just so nice. So arg powers. All right. So I've got a couple things here. Let me turn on my... There we go. So I'm using a virtual environment, uh, which is a talk we should also have here at probably the PBJs. But basically, it's a Python sandbox so that I don't install a bunch of junk into my system Python. Let me make this bigger. Can you guys see that all right? So I've got a couple command line tools. Uh, there it's being a little weird command line tools I've written in this directory. And so we'll start with the, the old school. Uh, so if I run Python old school, and if I don't specify the correct number of arguments for my script, it gives me a little usage down here. And this is something that uh, arg pars will do for you. Now, if we actually take a look at that code that is doing this, go to old school presentation mode. All right. So this is kind of the old school way of doing that, where you would actually import sys. You would write your doc string manually, or your usage string manually in the uh, like a, in a you know string variable here inside of Python, and then you would have to check, you know, did they specify enough arguments of the command line to satisfy what my program is requiring? And if they didn't, I'll print the usage to them. And if they did, I'm going to echo what that says. So if we actually try this out, if I do old school foo, it will echo back to me foo. Oh, why am I, oh, my command line's a little too small for this. OK, that's better. So you kind of get the gist of what a, a usage statement is. The argparse version of this is much, much simpler. So we can actually control some of the usage content, uh, the contents of that file, but we do it programmatically. So instead of us actually 
giving us the usage like this. If I do the echo args, oops, let me do echo args v1. Here we go. This is the ver same version of that same program, but instead of using the sys to, to parse, maybe make this bigger. That might be a little easier for you guys to see, or maybe I can't. Let's go here, much bigger. Maybe, I don't know. All right, if you guys can't read it, let me know. I'll switch to a different editor. But we instantiate an instance of the argument parser. We add arguments to our parser object, and then Python's you know, arg parser is aware of our arguments. In this case, we've added a positional argument called echo with a help string of echo, the string you type here. And then the, we call the parse args method <clears throat> method directly on our parser, and it figures out what's been passed in from that command line automatically for us. It does all the validation, and it ensures that we uh, get that one argument off of the command line for us so that we can uh, run the program. So let's run this version of the program. So if we don't specify the correct number of arguments, <clears throat> it gives us a brief usage statement. And you notice that it has a minus H option there for us. So if we actually ask for help, then we get the generated uh, usage statement coming from argpars. So argpars has made this for us. It has put in there the usage, the positional arg arguments, and then by default it includes a, a help argument that generates this extended help for us. So this is all built into argpars. If you want to take this to a, the kind of next level where we get the ability to control a, a little more verbose description, if we want to have some text after the options, if we want to have example arg text that's, that's different, we can do that, and I'll show you that. Hold on, I was looking at the wrong project here. So in this case, I've taken my <coughs> previous example, and when I instantiate the argument parser, I give it a description and an epilogue. And so this text will now be included at the front of my usage and at the end of my usage automatically. And then it's basically the same program after that. The only difference here is I've included some additional descriptive text at the front and the back. So echo args v2. So same kind of thing. The brief message is really similar. But when I get the uh, more verbose help, you can see it's included my description and my epilogue in the uh, the output there automatically. And you can change what the positional and optional arguments and how those actually show the example args being passed in uh, really easily. So that's the usage. We support long and short args, so if you want to use the single dash flag of some kind with an argument passed in or that turns on a flag or turns off a flag, you can do that. You can use the dash dash long args. We also support abbreviations. So if you didn't want to type out dash dash configuration all the way, you can actually type dash dash conf. And it does, as long as it doesn't conflict with another long arg that starts with conf, uh, arg pars will figure that out and know that you actually wanted to use the configuration long argument. Yeah, I think I've got an, arg, an example of that code. So if we want to look at the short args. So this is an example of using short args. In this case, we're going to have a dash A stores a Boolean, true or false. So if you did, uh, and you'll see the example down here, when I do dash A, that stores a true or a false in the A value. Uh, dash B will store into a variable called B, so args.b, uh, some value, whatever, whatever argument is passed in. So in this case, val is being passed into the short argument for b. And then c can actually cast a variable into a specific data type. So if you actually wanted an integer, uh, you know, from the command line, everything's a string. I mean, it's all just text being typed into the command line. Python doesn't know you necessarily wanted one, but arg parse can actually help you coax that data into the correct data type and also validate it. So if they put in a, a, a thing that's not an integer for the minus c option, our pars will give an error, a validation error back and show them the usage so that you can actually uh, check that. So if we actually run this script, you 
You'll see it parsed the, the values that came out of that, the example parsing there. This, this was what was passed in, a list of minus A, minus B val, minus C, and then the three. And so arg parse has converted that into uh, a Boolean, a string, and an integer for us automatically. We can do the same thing with the long args. So I'll show you the example first. In this case, it has parsed in, instead of simple one letter variables, we've got the long names with a integer, string, and Boolean. Uh, the example looks very, very similar, except in this case, instead of using dash A, dash B, dash C, You'll see here we've got the dash dash no arg, dash dash with arg, and dash dash with arg two as the uh, arguments to our, our command line option. Now, the, you saw in the previous examples the keyword action for store or store true. Uh, argument can have different actions. In this case, store stores it into a specific variable. Uh, store constant would be if you've provided a flag and you wanted to store that where you weren't passing in, we weren't wanting the value passed in on the command line, but the, the presence of the flag would store some kind of variable passed in via the argument. True and false are for the Booleans appending if you actually wanted to, if they provided your flag multiple times, it would automatically append those to a list for you and give you back a list object as part of the arguments. Uh, account, the number of things. Help is on by default. That's what gives you the minus H that's automatically there, and I didn't have to specify it in my arg parser. And you can actually specify an action for version. So if you actually wanted to have like a minus V or dash dash version to your program, uh, that can output like the version of your actual program. Yes. Oh, uh, you wouldn't, I don't know if it supports the equal to. Does it? I don't know. In the long ops, it supports it. So if you're using the dash dash B or some long option, then you could use the equal. But you can have minus B val or minus B space val. I don't think you can do minus B equal val. That's only for the long ops. So everyone understand the difference between long ops and short ops? Long ops have the two dashes, and it's usually some kind of word or like dash separated sentence of things. And the short options are usually single dash with one character as the, as the option you're, you're expecting in your application. Uh, you, so you can actually do that. You can specify short and long ops for the same option storing it into the same variable. You can also specify more than one arg after the, after the flag to be stored in as a list. So for example, if you had a, an option and you're expecting them to put a series of options or characters onto the command line, you can grab all that as one list and store it in that same variable. It's also possible. It's really flexible, which is one of the reasons I really like it. Uh, the last example I want to show you before we go into that, I think that's all of them. Yes. So this is all awesome for basically getting in your command line arguments to your script. But now I want to be able to put out some fancy like output for, from my script. Uh, that's where this third party library called Clint comes into play. So it's written by Kenneth Reitz, who's the requests guy. And it stands for command line interface tools. Uh, it's also, it's been currently maintained by Jason Piper. So he, Kenneth has been going around and finding maintainers for all his projects like a good open source citizen, which has been awesome. And he's been very successful at it because there's lots of people using his tools. Like I know two of the 10 people who are committers to this project just by being involved in the uh, open source, or just being an open source community. So Clint is awesome. So for the output, I mean, we just saw a simple, basically I printed back to the screen you know, the one string of characters. But if you wanted to have cool stuff like colors and columns and prompts with menus and much, much more, Clint is the way you want to go. So let's do a quick demo of Clint so you guys can see that. I'll show you the first demo here. So without Clint, if I do list buckets, I've written a command line script here, and it has, uh, it takes quite a few options. So if I do minus H, Basically, I've written a 
Amazon script that will, uh, oops, wrong one. I don't want V2. Here we go. So there's a command line script that is expecting a Amazon profile, so you can have multiple profiles for your credentials, like your keys and your secrets. And then it expects a specific bucket, and then it's an S3 bucket, and it's going to give you a listing of all the keys that are in that S3 bucket. So if I do a quick example, personal minus B. So I've got a bucket called Calvin HP dash blog demo. It has two keys in it called encrypt me and encrypt me two. I've got another example one in here. Oh shoot, what's the thing that thing called? Oh, here we go. So we have another bucket on there called pothole track, which is actually something we did for the Civic Hackathon. Uh, this has a bunch of stuff in it. Basically, it's a website hosted out of S3, and I wanted to get a listing of all the stuff in there. What would be awesome is if I could get that listing and have it colorized and have it in columns and have an additional column for the size of the objects so I could see how big these things were. But let me show you the code so far, what we're looking at right now. So this is all the code this, it takes right now to basically contact S3, list all the items in the bucket. I'm using the, you've probably seen this before, the if under under name equal under under main uh, bit and wondered what that's about. If we wanted to be able to use this same Python code as a library, like if I wanted to be able to import this module and call list bucket, I would need to be able to do that without actually executing the whole code. And be, I'd want to probably specify my own BOTO3 session with my own profiles and things. So using this under under name equal under under main, that allows Python to tell us whether we're running as a script from the command line or whether someone's importing us as a library to use in their own program. So this gives us flexibility for having our program be either a script and a library at the same time uh, very easily. So I've put my arg parser in here because this, is only hap this only happens if we're running as a script from the command line or if someone's called Python minus M and executed our module, we're actually executing as main. And so we call arg parser, here's my profile. So you can see I'm using a long ops and a short opt in the same add argument. I'm storing it and it's required. So I don't, I don't wanna, I need both of those to be able to call my list bucket with the session and the bucket there. If I take this a step further, this one's a little bit longer, but not much more complicated. I've added in the version, which is that additional action here. So we've got an action for version, so I can show off like version 1.0. Uh, I don't require the bucket anymore. In this case, I'm going to give them a menu of all the buckets that are in my account and allow them to choose which one they want to see all the keys in. So it's a little more user friendly. And so we now can pass in um, to list bucket none here. And if the, if the bucket is none, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to list the buckets, bring them all back, and then I'm going to use Clint. This is where our first place we're bringing in Clint. We're going to use the prompt right here, where you, all Clint needs is a list of things. If Clint has a list of strings, it will produce a menu and give you like a number so you can just choose one, two, three, four, five, six. Based on that, I will then go and list off the keys that are in that specific bucket, whatever was returned from that prompt, and then I'll colorize them. So this is Clint again. The puts, the columns, and the colored are all Clint giving us some nice little utilities to colorize and put columns on to our output. So let's show you what that looks like. Oh, and I also, oops, you'll notice that I made this one, uh, it's executable, and it had the shebang at the top. So I can actually run it without having to type Python. So if I just do list bucket.py like that, I get the uh, required option, profile, the optional option of a bucket, which is in square brackets, and then the optional option for version right here. So you can see which ones are optional and which ones are, are required really easily. So if I do bucket, I'll do dash dash bucket. Oh. Thank you very much. We're, we actually know it's profile. Profile is the required one here. So I'm using my personal profile. 
And so here, Clint is making us this nice little menu. You can see these are all the various buckets that are in here. And so if I tap six and hit return, it now prints out with green and red and with nice columns the uh, size of the objects and all the keys that are in the objects, or all the keys that are in the bucket. Uh, and he said there was 30 lines of Python code to get that all to happen, which is really nice. Any questions? That's, that's, I'm done, so that we're, we're on time there. Yeah? Absolutely. Right, because you can make sub parsers for like sub commands with arg parse, but I think click makes that very, very easy to do if you want to have like git style sub commands, like git m, git mv, or git check in, git commit, or whatever. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so Click is by Armin Ronecker, who did Flask, and then this, the Clint is by Kenneth Wrights, who did Requests, and amongst other things. Well, same thing for Armin. He's, done, he's been very prolific. He did such great uh, libraries such as Zine. <laughs> Sorry, I had to bring that one up. It's an inside joke. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, no, actually, it, it is smart enough to figure that one out. So if I do dash dash version, I will get the, the version string specified by arg parse there. So it's kind of like, like help. Help's also an optional, and version's also an optional. Those actions are special and will still work even if the required arguments are not there. Cool. Well, thank you all. Uh, we will have uh, James up next, and he's going to be giving you. This is why you guys actually came. You didn't come to see me. You came to see James. So I will let him get set up, and we will uh, continue on with IndiePie. Thanks a lot. <laughs>